The exciting conclusion of today, we have Zheng Hong Wang tell us topological physics beyond any on spectrum of black holes. Thanks, uh, the organizer, for the invitation. So, uh, I will talk about uh, topological physics beyond anions. So first I should say what I uh, mean by topological physics still means gapped, not gapless. Uh, there are people trying to make sense of topological for gapless. That's much more interesting and much more harder. So I'm still in the kind of a conventional regime. Uh, so there are lots of possibilities for us to extend beyond anions, you know, uh, study with uh, Iris on gap the boundaries with the long term uh, symmetry defects. They are all kind of uh, anions. But I want to be uh, a little bit more exotic. So, uh, two directions I can think of, as I have some work on, is fractons and black holes. So, uh, <coughs> fractons is kind of one dimension higher. So, anions really for two plus one, fractons is kind of three plus one, uh, which is very interesting. And black hole is still 2 plus 1, that's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, it's kind of another direction of extension of topological point of field theory, which is normally, as Dan explained, when you think about topological point of field theory as a mathematician, the domain are so-called closed manifolds, which means manifolds compact without boundary. But for the study of black hole, I think we need to extend the domain to so-called open manifolds. But topologists, which I am, open means not compact and no boundary. So that's open means. So the standard example would be Euclidean space. But that's not terribly interesting. There are much more interesting open manifolds. So that's what I believe uh, what we need to kind of extend the uh, top part of the discussion to black holes. <coughs> so also, uh, because of the time constraint, I uh, will focus more on black holes than fractons, because I gave uh, several talks on fractons already. So uh, for those, just to recall uh, the anion physics, uh, in a sense it's well understood. Uh, there are several ways to think about it, like it's kind of all mentioned today. So one way to think about it, as Dan explained to you, you know, there's this topological field theory. We imagine if you have a space manifold, and then you have a Hilbert space. And the Hilbert space should be uh, corresponding to whatever the physical system you put on the space, and then there's a ground state manifold. And this is a map. And that should form a topological point of field theory that, in a sense, is how Xiaoga started the whole subject. When you talk about topological order, he considered this map of map the system of space manifolds and the ground state manifold. But it's much more convenient to work locally. So instead of thinking all the space and all the space manifolds, it's much easier to think about a patch. And then you think about only elementary excitations. But you don't just think about that too much. You want to think about elementary excitation modular local operators. So you collect them into equivalence relation, and that's modeled very well by a mathematical structure called unitary modular tensor category, which I mentioned already, and that's the anion model. And those two are basically the same. And then also, uh, there's another way to think about it, which is this kind of a both add correspondence in Montron's talk. You can think about conformal field theory on the boundary. And I kind of believe every uh, modular tensor category has a stable has a stable gap boundary. As I already mentioned, there's always a gapless boundary, but not necessarily stable. I think there's always a stable a stable gapless boundary. So this is always the think about anion models, and uh, I won't really uh, talk too much because I want to talk about beyond, which is uh, the two paper uh, ones with uh, Xie Chen uh, Kevin's here and the uh, Xie student uh, be over uh, on these fractons. And then there's a new paper which I want to focus on, which is I want to make an argument that uh, there's a very good kind of argument that actually the two plus one gravity with certain uh, values would be corresponding to Ising theory. And that's what I will focus on. And this is a joint work, I will make the name again, uh, Chao Min, Andrew Ludwig, uh, Zhu Xi, and uh, Shen uh, Yi Hao. So, uh, so that's what I'm going to talk. Uh, you can ask why black holes actually, uh, Mong Chen already mentioned. It's kind of, actually many people have asked me this question before, which is, we have this bulk edge correspondence. If you have a top particle field matter, the bulk is a top particle point of field theory, and I believe every top particle point of field theory, there's a stable gapless boundary, which is the conformal field theory. 
And then we also have ADS-CFT, and uh, somehow they should be related because both anions and black holes should be related to chiral, uh, should be related to primal fields. And the difference I want to say is that actually uh, this is kind of a non-compact version of that because we should be talking about asymptotic boundaries rather than real boundaries. Okay, so that's what I want to uh, argue. And uh, although I won't really uh, talk much about fractal physics, but I think it's very interesting to think about them. Uh, one is this really challenge of understanding of convention topological physics. And also, uh, there's some potential application for building self-correcting quantum memory. <coughs> to me, actually, the most interesting actually would be to study the uh, loop statistics. And actually, Joe Wang can give a much better argument that's kind of a duality between, you know, in the fractal model, you kind of froze all the uh, motion of the particles, but there's still loops they can move. And there's some kind of duality between operators and motion. And for the so-called type 1, I think uh, it's very good to think about uh, fractal because it's kind of about mathematician. It's very natural to think about them. You know, you have local symmetry, you have gauge symmetry, which basically could dimension 0 or could dimension n, and they have a global symmetry, and there's nothing to print what to you know, consider the symmetry in between. <coughs> and the only thing that's harder, because without you know, substructure, it's hard to say what is the symmetry on one dimension, two dimension. And the natural mathematical notion is foliation, which tells you what you mean by some symmetry, which is one dimension, two dimension. And uh, I never liked the word fractal, so I was joking. We shouldn't be called fractal. Fractal, which we call particle of foliation. So there's a Chinese translation, which is very funny. <laughs> but <laughs> so anyway, so I think there are lots of good reasons to think about fractons. And, but that's not what I'm going to talk today. So uh, today I want to make uh, an argument. Actually, I can almost claim it's a mathematical theorem. So the real thing is to figure out, do I make a reasonable assumption or not? So that's what I'm going to do. If it's a good, I mean, a mathematical section. So uh, what I want to claim for you is that this is again the joint work with uh, Station Q, Pustov, Chalmin, Jiang, and Peter Ludwig, with the physics of uh, UCSB, Jushi Luo, and Hao Chun Yu. So, uh, so I want to claim if you take 2 plus 1 Einstein gravity with negative cosmological constant in anti decitus space of radius L, and you have this so-called brown no central charge which is three times the uh, anti-decision radius L divided by two times the Newton constant in three dimensions. If this is one half, and I claim the dual theory on the boundary, the asymptotic boundary, should be the Ising CFT. Uh, so that's what I'm going to make an argument uh, for. So, uh, so let me say a little bit about uh, 3D Einstein gravity. So uh, it's a well-known thing. Actually, not easy for me to understand, actually. I spent some time. So uh, if you count the degree, class of degree freedom of gravity in D dimension, it's a D quantity D minus 3. So if you plug in D for 3, it gets 0. So that said, there's no local thing. There's no local gravitational thing. So therefore, the, the gravity inside is rigid. And in that sense, it's topological. You know, there are no local things, just like the Simon theory. And also, uh, if you look at the literature, there are many, many different ways to quantize 2 plus 1 gravity. <coughs> In this paper, six ways to quantize 2 plus 1 gravity. So there are many different ways. The question, we don't really have a question to select which one is correct. And now even there are two recent, very substantial quantization also related to this. So there are lots of ways to quantize 2 plus 1 gravity. Uh, and also, uh, there are some beautiful mathematical theorems related to gravity, uh, 2 plus 1 gravity. So there are three of them I want to mention. One is, you can rewrite the, trans the, the 2 plus 1 gravity Einstein theorem, but action as double turn Simon theory. And this is completely rigorous. You just write using your spin connection, right? you can just rewrite formally, it will equal. Of course, it doesn't mean the quantum theory are the same. You know, there are singularities. Gauge transformation not the same thing as diffeomorphism, so there is some subtlety there. But classically, they are really the same. And then there's a famous Brown New theorem, which is I think a precursor of ADS-CFT, which is that uh, 
if you look at the asymptotic symmetry, what it means is that if you put a gravitational field on a non-compact manifold at a well-defined boundary condition, and you want the diffeomorphism to preserve the boundary condition, and that forms some algebra, and you see the beautiful Virasori algebra came up, and there's a central charge, which is 3L divided by 2G, G is a Newton constant. And that's the so-called Brian No theorem. And then there's a surprise, which is uh, this so-called BTC black holes for negative cosmological constant. You know, just write down this beautiful metric. So those are all mathematical theorems, actually. Uh, so now you can say, okay, well, suppose you know we want to do 3D bread, what do we do? No, you guys all know better than me. You know, you're physicists, you sum over topology, you sum over geometry. And uh, two plus one dimensions is very special uh, because we know really we know all the three manifolds and all the geometry in your six. You know, we have geometrization conjecture and we pretty much a list them. Actually, even better, Friedman and other people, they even put a ordering on all three manifolds. Literally, you can just order them all. So in that sense, you know, we really know how to sum them all. And there's another beautiful theorem which is very important, which is a kind of a version of a book edge correspondence, which is in hyperbolic geometry, Dennis Solomon is an incredible mathematician. So he proved a theorem that hyperbolic geometry inside a manifold corresponding to conformal symmetry on the asymptotic boundary. And there's a one law correspondence. So all those beautiful mathematical theorem is pretty useful when you think about uh, this. So therefore, uh, what I want to do now is to argue for you that in this particular value, uh, two plus one gravity, potentially is due to icing CFT. So here are the assumptions I will make. As I said, I'm a mathematician, so I will list all the assumptions I make. And uh, I'm not saying I'm claiming they are all correct, but if you give it this assumption, then pretty much it's a theorem. So the first is that uh, we assume uh, the gravitational partition function is a summation over classical settle points. Uh, this is definitely the physics argument of, you know, by perturbation theory, by large central charge, and I would claim probably this is the weakest assumption in all this thing. Okay, so I assume the partition function has a form which is summation over a classical settle. And then uh, I will always do Euclidean geometry, so I rotate the time, and then that means sum over hyperbolic three manifolds. Okay. So that's the first assumption. And then this equal is not quite right, this is asymptotic boundary. Okay. So that's the first assumption. And the second assumption is that uh, the partition function of the thermal EDS is, we call them a vacuum seed. And we want to start with this one. Uh, we just give a name. And this depends on the conformal structure of the asymptotic boundary. And then the another major assumption is the other set of contributions can be all summed into the action of the mapping class group. Okay? And for genus 1, the mapping class group is SL2Z. So therefore, for the other contribution, you take this vacuum C you act in the conformal structure by this mapping class group, and that's moved to another, and you just sum them up. Okay, so that's our assumption. And there's an argument due to Wheaton and Maloney in a paper that for genus one, that's actually all of them. Uh, so basically what we want to do is want to generalize this to all high genus. And uh, there's two things here I want to mention. One is we made another assumption, which is we we'll have this action here. Suppose you have a matching class group element which fits the vacuum scene. And then we throw this into new gauge symmetry. So we kind of enlarge the gauge symmetry. Okay. So the stabilizer is considered a new symmetry. And the second, okay, this, the last one is not an assumption. The last one is a comment <coughs> that if you think about this, you want to say, okay, yeah, now you can just do the sum over the matching class group. Uh, the problem is the matching class groups are known first, obviously, the infinite group, so it's a submission of the infinite. Uh, but it's more important the matching class groups are not a minimal. But a, not a minimal means that they don't have a natural measure. Okay? You cannot just regularize them easily. Okay? So that's the major problem, which is if a group is a minimal, that means it has a version almost like a hard measure. You know, all the discrete groups. But they can just sum them up using that measure. And magic class are not a minimal, so you definitely cannot just naively sum them. 
So therefore, what we want to do is that we want to look for theory which makes sense at least. Okay, so there's some makes sense. So, and uh, it turns out if you have the, uh, sorry, oh. if the brown and no simple charge uh, is one half, uh, which means three times the uh, ADS radius divided by two G is one half, and we can show with the assumption I said mathematically, the gravitation partition function for every genus is proportional to the partition function from the Eisen CFT. Okay. Uh, this is a generalization of a paper by Castro et al. They did the case of the genus one. And they use a fact which is well known to uh, uh, people studying modular tensor category, which is for genus one, the mapping class group always has a finite image. Uh, that's first observed by Eke Kanselic. And then, uh, actually, in their paper, they said, you know, we couldn't do the other one because they all have an infinite memory. You know, my really major contribution is I know the fact that I in theory, not only the genus one have finite image, any genus has finite image. So therefore, this is always a finite sum. You don't need regularization. And so that's only one important math fact we need. There's another important math fact, which is the representation has to be reducible in order to make this argument. So, so therefore, uh, let me just say what I want to argue for you, which is I argue that for the broad no simple charge one half, the partition function of two plus one gravity is proportional to the Ising partition function, with some constant depends on the genus. And this constant is very interesting, and I don't think it's universal, but it definitely should split into two pieces. One piece is that uh, it's a TPFT, so therefore it's a representation of the mapping class group and that said the image should be finite, so there should be the number of, of images, the order of the image group divided by the dimension. <coughs> I think that piece should be universal. And then there's some non-universal piece inside. So, but this is much better, this first eight. And we did a genus two calculation with the 384. Okay, so that's what I argue. I want to make another comment of... Eight minutes. What? Eight minutes. Eight minutes, okay. I think I can do it. I want to make another comment, which is of you, if you only take TPFTs, and if, there are, if you know their partition function are all the same on three manifolds, two plus one, it doesn't mean they are the same TPFT. Okay. So this definitely not necessarily said I, you know, this completely you know, nailed down the question, but I think it, I would consider the strong argument that this is uh, possible. Okay, so, so what's the strategy for general genus? So for general genus, we want to sum over uh, the settled and it becomes a question of sum over matching class group, and then you need to uh, mod the stabilizer. So basically you sum over a portion of the matching class group image, and then mod by the stabilizer. And it turns out, as I said, we need two facts, which is both are important. One is we need a matching class group to have a finite image, and therefore we don't need any regularization, it's just a finite sum. And the second thing, we need the reducibility of the representation. And that turns out, give you the proportionality, it, elementary as everybody knows, it's called Schur's lemma. If you have something which is modular invariant, and it's an irreducible representation, so therefore the intertwiner is always differ by a constant. And that's exactly what we argue. Okay. So we argue both the, web, the, the gravitational uh, partition function and the Ising function, they are all uh, modular invariant uh, because of the reducibility, so they're only proportional by a constant. So you yeah, ask why high genus? Uh, that's because we do Euclidean geometry, and if you do uh, analytic continuation, and uh, there's a paper uh, tells you that you need to double the Lorentzian signature, which is basically, uh, <coughs> if you look at the, you cut from here, you just pick up the grid circle as t equals zero for the Lorentzian signature, and then you do Euclidean, you double them. So that's you go to a high genus. And then uh, the Brown a new theorem uh, is basically give us the starting point, which tells us that if you <coughs> want to compute the gravitational uh, partition function, you study the vacuum state, and then you study the gravity the, the boundary graviton with corresponding to descendant field uh, in the conformal field theory, 
And then if you just go through the argument of Brown and Lu, you realize that turns out for this vacuum C, that's actually would match up the uh, conformal field theory. So basically, the Brown and Lu theorem I claim tells you that the vacuum C match with the, uh, the conformal field theory. And that's also exactly how they argue too. And then, uh, once you have this vacuum sheet and you form the modular uh, sum, and as I said, now you instead of sum over the mod, the whole mapping class group is sum over the portion. And that's a final sum. And then, uh, you write this thing down, and you, uh, the, what I should say is, you know, I think CKFT or CKFT, that's a something Microsoft's spending lots of money on. So we almost know everything about that theory. So there's nothing we really don't know. So uh, you just you know, look at the theory. Uh, pretty much any question you want to know, we, we have it. And uh, then uh, finally, you know, as I said, what it is, you need to show that actually the representation has a final image. Uh, that's actually not very easy. Uh, but we, uh, this is one map. Two of the mathematical facts we need to prove, which is uh, the Ising theory has a finite image for all mapping class representations. And this is well known for braid group representations. And that's why, in a sense, you know, Microsoft is, spending, is kind of spending money on nothing in the sense that even if we build a Majorana quantum computer, uh, that's a classical computer <laughs> because the image is finite, so you cannot do all the quantum computation. Uh, it's even worse than finite. The only thing you get is width and cleaver. Uh, that's can be simulated by classical computer. So a fully Brady Majorana quantum computer is a classical computer in your sense. It's a classical computer with a quantum memory. So, so that's well known for Brady. And I also say that's also true for mapping class group. There's nothing you can do in terms of universality. You know, the representation of mapping class group for any genus is a finite image. So that's uh, the first theorem we need. Uh, that's what I call extended property F. Property F means that you have an L <coughs> and the Bradians all have finite image. Extended means the mapping class group also have finite image. And the next thing is actually, uh, it not only the repetition is a finite image, the repetition is obviously reducible. And that's, you know, i really impressed by physicists. You know, I have this, you know, the Zhu uh, Xilu, she was a graduate student then, you know, I, I didn't believe it's irreducible because I have theoretical argument it has to be reducible. But it turns out this theory is so special that P is supposed to be reducible is zero. <laughs> so this is why this Isaac theory is so special. There's a sector corresponding to fermions. It turns out that sector is zero. So, so that is special. And uh, so it's irreducible. And then I think that's almost my last slide. So you ask why Isaac uh, you know, they have a little bit more than what I said. They also have this so-called topological censorship, which is any non-trivial prime field have a scaling dimension of the conformal weight bigger than the central charge divided by 24. I think inside the minimum model, there are only two. Uh, the other is the tri-critical. But you can rule out, actually, uh, in the paper by Castro et al., so they argue that two possibilities due to gravity. One is icing, and the other is tricritical. And uh, using that, the mapping class group have found an image, and uh, using this fact. But we can easily rule out the tricritical uh, naively because tricritical have infinite image for high genus. So therefore, you cannot really sum them up without regularization. So uh, I think I will stop here by uh, just something I'm not completely uh, convinced by myself, which is, uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, I have this kind of, many people do, it's kind of like any mm -hmm. are related to black holes. And uh, I personally think probably related to gap to boundaries. <laughs> and uh, my co-author, they didn't like my suggestion because that's why it's something, uh, like a new hair or something. So, uh, but anyway, I think it's uh, definitely somehow related in a not superficial way, which is uh, the two plus one gravity should be considered a new kind of top particle field theory, and how to capture this algebraically by extending more of the tensor category, gap the boundary, those things would be very interesting. I'll stop here, thank you.
<coughs> I want to ask about this uh, coefficient between the C graph and the C yeah. easing yeah. for different genuses. Yeah. So the coefficient depends on the genus G. Uh, absolutely, uh, because we calculate. Yes. So for genus 1 is A, I think this is a very solid A. Uh, uh -huh. This is the, for those who know, the, uh, the ISM image is 24, and the dimension is 3, so it's 24 divided by 3. I think there's nothing now local there. But. So uh, if these are coefficients CG, can be written as a local counter term, so should that be, the two yeah. theories are indeed equivalent, yeah. then CG should be some constant times the constant to the power G. Uh, so, uh, no, so well, it's G, but not quite G. I think the right, uh, my guess, is that it should be E, some part of universal constant, and the oil characteristic yes. of the surface. And that has to do with, I think, even in conformal field theory, I think the, the partition function is not well defined until you choose a conformal framing. And so therefore, you really need to do uh, something there to match up. So I think there's a local piece which is proportional to E and the order characteristic. Uh -huh. And that's why this one I think is much more interesting because the order characteristic of torus is zero. So you think C2 can be absorbed by a local company? Well, you, you can always say, I oh, can redefine the measure uh, to you know, absorb this one. But I think it's just like you know, Dan already mentioned in transamo theory, that this interesting phenomenon of a little bit of gravitational thing, you know, residual Riemannian metric thing. I think that's what it is. So I, th I think it's very related to you know, the partition function on both sides. There's some local things you can, you can you know, do. Uh, so I wouldn't, you know, it's kind of like, I, I, I personally think this is a very interesting question how to separate this piece. One piece has to be the image divided by the dimension of the representation. Oh, just to make sure, so Brecton only appear in the beginning, but not in the, uh, Brecton doesn't hear appear in the later part of the talk. Uh -huh. Sorry, I'm going to hear you, sorry. Just uh, want to make sure, is Brecton connect to the second part of the talk? Yeah, yeah, they do. Uh, I mean, I cut out that piece. So, uh, I've been interested in Brecton ever since, you know, Joe Wong was a graduate student. You know, I always ask him the same question for many years. Could you put your model on general three manifolds? And I think the last answer he gave me is the surface cross S1. And the topologies, I don't like that at all. That's nothing, you know, in terms of all three manifolds, the surface cross S1. So uh, I wrote a paper with some other people uh, explaining <coughs> that in all three manifolds. And in order for me to do that, I claim, there's another claim I'm making, that the fractal model should be either considered as a lattice model of a poise in the universal cover of the three manifolds, or as a lattice of loops inside the manifolds. Okay, that's what I might, uh, what my claim is like, the right generalization of fractal to all three manifolds. If you think that way, and then the right way to think about fractal would be think of the universal cover, and that's a non-compact manifold. And I'm interested in the thermodynamical limit of fractal, so I need to think about non-compact QPFT. Okay, well, I have a few slides on this I cut out because of time. So I believe the, the common thing is we need to extend QKFT non to non-compact manifolds. And can one also define this um, space-time manifold as a pass in the four dimensions? Yeah, yeah I think it's, it's, it's So basically, I want you know, just for those who know uh, the hard code, I believe you know, this is, is the, the so-called hard code is defined among the three torus, T3, and the Z3 is a fundamental group. And then, uh, for general three manifolds, the model should be defined on the fundamental group. And then, what's the periodic boundary condition means in general three manifolds? That should be a finite index normal subgroup. And then you define another quotient, and then you do a cover. So that, that's the common theme of the two topics. But I cut off the first part because of time. Another question is that uh, you make an between black hole and perhaps any or gap boundary. Yeah. But is there some notion of like horizon? Like, like I have to admit, my gravity knowledge is a zero. I could answer that one. But uh, I, just, I just, you know, I just think about the math. The gap boundary uh, sounds better to me than any. Yeah. If there are no more questions, let's thank Jim Hunting again.